And if there's anybody in the room who has an idea for a book for our series, we'd be really interested to hear from you. I have. Um, I have. I'm going to speak in English, so now might be the time to put your headphones on. Not least because I speak English with quite a, a heavy regional accent, so it might be difficult for somebody, some of you to understand. I'm suspecting it might be difficult for the translators to understand me as well, so I'm going to speak very clearly if I possibly can. In actual fact, the research that I'm presenting here, um, me and Christina are in engaging with a, a very similar set of debates. Um, Christina has looked at, at young people and young people's responses to images. My focus as a researcher is on media and cultural text, so I focus on the products that the media uh, produces. And my issue of debate is what's generically and sometimes quite unhelpfully described as sexualization. It's a term that I contest. It's a term that lots of other scholars in my field contest. I'm largely a, a, a researcher of pornography, very specifically gay pornography. That's what I've been writing about for 20 years now. Goodness me. Right, so. If you get bored of listening to me or you can't understand me, there'll be lots of fabulous pictures to look at, so that's good news at least. So really what I need to do is start off by um, providing a set of contexts in which I need to situate the iteration of masculinity that I'm talking about. Broadly, I'm talking about masculinity in times of crisis, of course, Masculinity is always seen as in crisis at one point or another, ever since the end of the Second World War. Um, the iterations that I'm talking about are within a, a more contemporary context of what's generically known in the Anglophone world, at least, as toxic masculinity, so the relationships between masculinity and uh, sexual power and sexual violence. A neoliberal masculinity, so masculinity in moments where the values that masculinity used to be associated with uh, are, don't carry the purchase that they used to have. Um, a concern in some quarters that masculinity has become sexualized. I believe that is true. I don't personally see that that's something that we need to see as a concern. Many scholars do. Um, for specific uh, cultural groups, especially gay men, the connections between masculinity, what's known as subculturally as mask identities, and questions of um, equality, uh, liberty, and so on. And what I describe collectively to describe this um, range of phenomena uh, is saturated masculinity. So, I'm, I'm interested in sexualized masculinity. Um, I think this discussion is predicated, whether it's true or not, is predicated on the idea that something has changed within Western uh, popular culture and Western society. Something has changed in the past 25 to 30 years where men's bodies have suddenly become a site, uh, visible in the first case and secondly a site of erotic investment. I'm not necessarily saying this is true but certainly this is the tenor of debate. There's be become since the mid-1980s a mainstream investment in the body, especially the male body. The male body has become commodified therefore and this, is, this, this pattern has escalated in part to do with the advent of the internet, so access to uh, sexualized representations of the male body have perhaps become more common. And this is often described within a broader context of this idea of a sexualized culture. I think it's a contested idea, but it's an idea that has purchase, has currency, it's an idea that um, Policymakers, scholars, popular commentators, lots of people now talk about the idea of a sexualized society and that's potentially as, um, cited as a problem. I think there's something also here to do with uh, gay visibility and the social acceptance of gay people within Western liberal uh, democracies at least. Yet more pictures, it's not going to stop. 
Um, I, I theorize this, I conceptualize this, this moment that we're living through and these, these types of masculinities as examples of what I describe as saturated masculinity. Um, that's based on the argument that masculinity itself used to be, in some mythological past, very narrowly defined. Um, that great cultural commentator Camille Pallier at one point argued that um, masculinity, that we should feel sorry for men, that feminists should feel sorry for men, because masculinity was like walking a very, very narrow tightrope, and you only had to step one way or you only had to step the other, and you would fall into this mass of femininity. Now, m my argument would be that this tightrope has kind of broadened and broadened and broadened, so it's a walkway that most men don't necessarily need to feel they're going to fall off and somehow uh, no longer be men anymore. I think ne we now live in a moment where masculinity carries the burden of many meanings and often competing and contradictory meanings. So effectively, masculinity has become saturated with meaning and this creates confusion for people, perhaps. It also creates the possibility for people imagining their masculinity in different ways. And I think the media and a, population, uh, a popular fixation with masculinities that the media um, often communicates has really played an important part in this. And I think porn itself is evidence of this, and I think gay porn is doubly so. One of my contentions is that gay porn is a really, really useful site in order to look at, analyze, and understand masculinity of any complexion. Cool. So, let's go back. So, to give you some examples of this idea that uh, masculinity has become saturated with meaning, here we have David Beckham. Um, in the embodiment of David Beckham, in da David Beckham's uh, construction as a celebrity and a star, we see the conjunction of sport, celebrity, sex, and the body. He's the epitome that, uh, Mark's, uh, of what Mark Simpson described as the metrosexual. Masculinity itself... Now we live in a moment where um, we, we're going through a recalibration of gender itself and a rejection of binarisms. And I think this is a, a challenge to masculinity as it's the default from which other uh, gender identities are often uh, identified and defined. Um, but masculinity itself is no longer reducible to either biology or physiology. In, in, in fact, this isn't the only model of masculinity that's available. This is a, 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 a very famous uh, American uh, porn performer and um, rights activist called Buck Angel. You may not be familiar with him. In yet more recent times, um, we have seen evidence of this new iteration of masculinity. I don't know that any of these models of masculinity look massively different in actual fact when you see them alongside each other, but this is a, a melding of the sportsman and the porn actor, and this isn't just about grooming, I don't think, but it's about individuals presenting their bodies as sexual objects. So this is a, a very specific narcissistic form of masculinity, which I think has always existed in actual fact. Um, the idea that spawn of sexuals like uh, representing themselves, constructing representations of themselves, photographing themselves. It's another one of Marx's neologisms, um, but I think it really has captured something of some uh, significance. And I think what's especially important here is this kind of connection between uh, conventionalized uh, sources for representations of masculinity and pornography as a site for sources of references of masculinity. This kind of melding of the two is uh, particularly important. Okay. Um, one of the problems, I think, with Anglophone scholarship, at least, is that in the English-speaking world, we've got a tendency to choose our very own specific objects of study um, as if they're evidence of global phenomena. And we tend to disregard what's happening in, in 
uh, parts of the world where people don't necessarily speak English. I think it's very, yes, I'm sure that is everybody's experience here. Um, we inevitably have to look further afield, I think, to re realistically talk about masculinity. And I think we can see in uh, the, the Hispanic world, especially in Spain, we can see evidence of a, a more overt, a more sexualized masculinity in this country. I'm a huge fan of Spanish popular culture. If I wasn't here at this moment, I would be watching Salvame, I would be watching Gran Hermano, I would be watching Ana Rosa, I, I devour these programs. And I'm very, very conscious of the, the kind of uh, very specific, uh, culturally specific versions of masculinity that we see presented in, in these programs. So we've got Rafa Mora here, um, at what we would describe as a tabloid dreamboat in England. And he's just going to one example, uh, he loves to uh, reveal his body at every available opportunity. He has uh, a very perfectly groomed face, plucked eyebrows. He wears lip gloss the whole time. He cries. I was very interested to hear that uh, Christina talking about how crying is uh, very problematic in, in Portugal and probably in Spain as well. Um, in, in the, in the English-speaking world, crying, men crying is increasingly seen as a sign of authenticity. So it's very surprising to hear me, hear you talk about the way in which these things are inflected differently. It's really important for us as scholars to realize these micro differences are actually really significant differences. We shouldn't universalize when we're talking about uh, cultural phenomena. I'm kind of universalizing a little bit here, so, but you'll, you'll forgive me, I'm on a stage. Um, yeah, another example, I'll, I'll gloss over this quite quickly. Uh, Esteban of Gandhi Ashore fame. Um, I'm arguing here that, that, that this is a phenomenon that you can see across Spanish popular culture. Uh, the spornosexual has been identified as a feature of Spanish popular culture and also a problem for Spanish popular culture. There have been articles recently in El País, in La Vanguardia, on television. Um, so, 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 so this is a phenomenon that Mark uh, kind of summoned into existence by coining a term, but the term itself has, has gathered pace and gathered life and come to articulate something very specific that's going on in other territories, not just in England, not just in America. I think the fact that Mark identifies that uh, sport and sex, sport and porn is really important here. I think porn is a really useful place to look at models of masculinity. Okay. But that doesn't mean that porn is an easy thing to look at. I've spent 20 years write, more than 20 years writing about uh, gay pornography. My PhD was on gay pornography many, many years ago when that was seen in, Brit in Britain at least as an absolutely extraordinary thing to want to do. It, uh, it met with some outrage in actual fact. I had to really argue my case. So porn even now is still quite a difficult thing to talk about, largely because the immediacy of the kind of response that porn provokes, shock, disgust, um, embarrassment, and so on, largely because also of the social position of porn, because it's a, a, a stigmatized form, even now. Okay. Um, and largely because we are still really, really ill-equipped to analyze sexual image, images we're not trained to do this. We're not taught to do this at school. Um, I, I do run courses on pornography in, in, in my university, but I have to invent a, a vocabulary. I have to invent a methodology in order to talk about this material because one doesn't exist. So it's a difficult thing to talk about, but I think it does matter. I think it matters because there are connections between uh, the pornography industry and new media. You know, um, the web has made it very much more easy for many more people to access this material. Um, so there really is a, a ubiquity of, of sexualized imagery. 
Um, some people argue that our, our, our culture has become overly sexualized and porn plays a part here because it's so commonplace. And I think the other reason it's really important, and for me this is the reason that it's really important, is because we learn about sex and sexuality ourselves through access to this material. And that's got implications that we need to think about. There are relationships between sexuality and conditions of knowledge and power. But writing about porn additionally has problems for researchers. Firstly, there's, there's an institutional queasiness. Um, the, 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 there's a cliche, uh, uh, kind of, I think uh, a fairly widely held cliche that uh, British academia is incredibly uh, liberal and laissez-faire in comparison to uh, some European countries. In actual fact, pornography research is really seen as uh, quite a contentious topic in, in the UK still. Um, People will make assumptions about your motivation when you're a, a porn researcher. There have been many occasions where people, after a presentation, have asked me sometimes quite uncomfortable questions about my reasons for having such an interest in this, and perhaps that's because I like to put theory into practice and so on. This isn't true. Um, when writing about porn, you're inevitably very often writing about something that is an, an, an ephemeral object of study. Material that is available online might not be available to you tomorrow, and that's something you have to think about. Uh, technological changes in, in turn result in changes to form and content. So um, th there's a need for a, a, an elasticity as a porn researcher, I think an elasticity in terms of thinking and writing, not a physical elasticity. Okay, so my argument is that porn, and particularly gay porn, is a, a good site for thinking about models of masculinity, and I think that's because of the iconography, the tropes, and the discourses that gay porn produces. I'm now going to show you some slightly more explicit images um, I don't believe in trigger warnings, but nonetheless, if you'd like to avert your eyes, you're more than welcome to. Okay. So, porn enables us to think about connections between sexual role, physicality, and performativity. Porn enables us to think about heteronormativity as a concept in and of itself. Um, the assumption that this kind of representation, this model of masculinity, this conjunction of heterosexuality and masculinity equates to sexual desirability, these are really closely, uh, closely linked ideas, and these are ideas that have connections to knowledge and power, and these are uh, ideas that have really big implications for gay men in actual fact. This is about, some people might argue, desiring an iconography and a set of values that gay men should be rejecting. So there is something to think about there. Um, gay porn enables us to think about ethnicity and nation as well, I think. Um, it reminds us kind of quite vividly and explicitly that masculinity is not always white. It also enables us to think about social class and that social class impacts on versions of masculinity. It also enables us to think about um, generation and that masculine representations change over generations, the ways in which uh, masculinity is figured when you were a very young man is not the same way that masculinity is figured and represented when you're um, a man in your middle age or a man who's older than that. So, yet again, porn enables us to think about these things. You, you all thought that uh, porn was just about jacking off. Well, it's about a lot more than that. Okay, I'm coming to my conclusion. The other thing that I think we need to think about is the connections between porn, the idea of amateurism, as am amateurism has become an incredibly important trope in pornography, and the idea of the self. Um, 
Amateurism in, in all its iterations really is changing the landscape of the porn industry and it really, I think, enables us, it connects us back to thinking about the ways in which young men via social media are constructing representations of themselves. So yet again, this connects to the kind of material that Christina was talking about. Um, in, in Anglophone parlance, we talk about the idea that young men are pornifying themselves, so making themselves, you know, creating porn, porn rep uh, representations of themselves. I don't know necessarily that that's the only thing that's going on here. Um, but I think we really need to discuss these things really carefully. In the first case, I think we need a conversation. I think we need to think about the relation between representations and the, the construction of the self. These things matter. I think we need to think about the political conditions under which sexualized masculinity emerges and why it's important. I think we need to think about the loaded nature of masculinity and the attendant pressures it presents, because I think they matter a great deal. I think it's not enough to write these images off as frivolous. I think it's not enough to dis uh, dismiss these young men as narcissists or shallow. I think there's something more going on here. And I think we really need a progressive, non-judgmental, non non -judgmental, non shaming language to explore this phenomena. So we need a conversation, we need a vocabulary, and we need a 21st century sexual ethics. And I think that's all I want to say. Thank you.